And you should now see this third um, slide, which is the, the outline of, the, of this particular lecture. Okay, so this is also what I'm going to do in these PowerPoints. I'm going to go ahead and give you the full outline early on in the lecture just so you can have a, an idea. So if, if we were in a physical classroom, this, this is what I would do is I would go ahead and um, hand out on a piece of paper this particular outline so that you could, as I'm making these points and going through these PowerPoint slides, that you would understand where each point fits into in the big structure of the lecture. Okay, so again, for those of you who tuned in late, if you scroll back in the uh, chat room box, you can see you, you can download this entire PowerPoint presentation to have it locally on your computer in case you need to move around and, and deviate from the, from the pace that I'm going through. Okay, so at this point, like I said, now I'm going to go ahead and, and, and go through each of these uh, points in this outline. All right, so what is Austrian economics? And we're going to give here the brief history. I did this last Monday as well because of the time crunch and the amount of material we have to go through. I'm not going to give you right now a brief history of the Austrian school. I mean, it's covered very well in the readings we've made available to you. In the Q&A, if you want to ask a particular question, you can. But I think uh, with the remaining time we have left for this particular lecture, that it makes more sense for me to just go ahead and, and move on to, to the next slide. The, um, this slide we're saying, what is Austrian economics? And we want to know the major tenets of the school. So here, this is, if you, if you took an undergrad class in Austrian economics, and this is true when I taught at Hillsdale College, I learned it from Richard Ebeling when I was a student there. And then also uh, when I used to teach it, these are the, the things we would go through in, in the first class of Austrian economics. Uh, we, would sit, we would try to distinguish it from other schools of thought, and we'd go ahead and give a bunch of the major tenets. Now, on this particular uh, issue, if you go and look at the lecture notes, you'll find I've hyperlinked to a lecture I gave it, I, I give it at the Mises University on uh, Austrian versus neoclassical analytics or mainstream analytics, something like that. So it's hyperlinked there. Again, it's not mandatory. It's just there for you if you want to pursue this further. And there I give you a full lecture on the specific differences between the Austrian approach to certain issues and the standard mainstream neoclassical approach. So for our lecture today, I'm not going to give you that full lecture, of course, because we, we have to boil it down to the essentials. I'm just going to focus on a few of the things that you would get in a typical uh, lecture or if you read a, a particular book trying to introduce you to the Austrian school. When Austrians explain what are they all about, these are some of the points that they hit especially if we're going to need to know how is Austrian economics different and how does that pertain to its business cycle theory. All right, so methodological individualism, that's a, an intimidating phrase. And all it really means is that as Austrian economists, when you want to explain something in the market, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do. In particular, we're trying to come up with a theory of exchange and we need to understand how objective price ratios are formed. I mean, that's basically, that's not all of what you do as an economist, but that's that's the core of it. I mean, if you're not doing that, then really you're not really doing economics, okay? That your theory needs to explain the formation of market prices. Not necessarily that you're going to predict it with accuracy and, and quantitative precision and say what the price of apples is going to be next Thursday, but that if someone says to you what causes the price of apples to be what, what it is, that you can give them a coherent story. All right, so that's that's where we're uh, coming from as economists, and I think most schools of thought would agree with that. So to say that we're talking that we're methodological individualists, what that means is that the the method that we use when we're going to explain economic phenomena has to ultimately be traced back to individual actions. All right, that's all the phrase means. So it doesn't mean that we believe in individualism in a political context or a spiritual or a moral sense, even though we, we might. But the point is, as economists, if we're going to give a satisfactory explanation for something that's happening in the marketplace, ultimately that explanation has to be reducible to things that individual actors are doing. And to give you, I think, I think the easiest way to see that is just to look at the contrast with other schools of thought. So, for example, uh, people who use the, the equation of exchange, 
that MV equals PQ, right? That uh, M is for the stands for the amount of money in the economy. V is stands for the velocity. So M times V equals P is the price level, and Q is is real output. So that's a standard equation that you'll see in a lot of uh, textbooks and also books for the layperson, like Milton Friedman uses that, and so a lot of the monetarists, that's their most important equation. It's called the equation of exchange. But yet that's that's an aggregated framework, right? The, the, the very components, the elements of the theory are themselves aggregates that you really can't easily reduce back to the actions of individuals. All right, so in that framework, if you want to explain why are prices rising, someone using that equation would say, well, it's either because the money supply is rising and velocity is staying the same, or uh, you know, real real output's not not offsetting it enough. And you just you just look at those four elements in the equation, and you see if one thing goes up, if something else doesn't counterbalance it, well, then P has to go up, and that's your explanation for price inflation. All right. Whereas the Austrians, they don't they don't even start at that level. They instead talk about, and we'll and we'll see this later in the class. Uh, talk about things like the individual's demand to hold money balances, right? And so we always start in terms of the individual and the subjective preferences the individual has, and then you can go ahead and, and build up from that foundation and talk about macro events like the business cycle, okay? So it's not that the Austrians just do what's typically called microeconomics. Rather, it's that the Austrians don't really believe in this dichotomy. They don't think that you need one set of tools to study the uh, exchange rate of apples for pears, and then you need a completely different set of tools to explain price inflation in general or to explain the boom-bust cycle. Whereas if you go into mainstream economics, that's typically how it is. It's not just that some people specialize in micro and some people specialize in macro. It's that the economic theory itself is, is totally different. All right. Um, let me just give a caveat there. A mainstream economist who heard that would probably say something like, well, come on, you're, you're overstating the difference. It's true in Keynesian economics back in the day in the 60s, we had what was called hydraulic Keynesianism. And, uh, and that was a very macro framework. It's true. People just looked at aggregate figures like, like uh, de aggregate demand and so on and gross investment at the economy-wide level. But now what they've done is given macro a micro foundation, right? So when I was going to NYU and getting my PhD there, I was taught by a lot of new Keynesians. And what that really means, that phrase, what that has to do with is the fact that they're integrating the insights of people like Paul, uh, uh, like Lucas, his uh, critique of the old school Keynesian models and trying to put in optimizing agents okay so this stuff if, if this is getting a little over your head don't worry i'm just trying to for those of you who understand what i'm talking about i just want you to really grasp the difference between the austrians and other schools of thought so other schools of thought they understand the problem if you can't reduce the theory back to acting individuals who are making decisions and trying to optimize in, in, in their terminology um and that was the the basis of the famous lucas critique is that the, the old school macro econometric models would give policy conclusions for the Federal Reserve that didn't make sense, that assumed the people in the economy were idiots and that they couldn't learn and that they, they wouldn't adapt to the new uh, policy rules. Okay, so that, so, so it's not that the Austrians have a monopoly on this insight of methodological individualism. The other schools recognize that that's a, a good goal to shoot for, but in practice, they're just really not even in the same zip code as the Austrians when it comes to fulfilling this, that even the, the new Keynesian models that you learn that apparently have micro foundations, they'll, the, the way they'll do that is they'll have what's called a representative consumer. And they'll have one guy in there who's supposed to represent all the consumers in the whole economy, and he has one utility function. Okay, and that's the way they think, okay, now we're, you know, we've given it micro foundations, all right, whereas as opposed to, as we'll see, the Austrian story, of course, doesn't assume that there's just one consumer, that it's more realistic in that respect. Okay, the next one, next tenant is methodological subjectivism. And here, um, 
again, there's a there's a sense in which just about everybody in modern economics is a subjectivist, and there's a sense in which no, really, the Austrians still can rightfully claim that this is something special to the Austrian school. Now, on both of these things, before I forget, let me mention there's been a recent discussion. If you if you go to the blog Think Markets, which is run by uh, Mario Rizzo and people of the NYU Colloquium, you'll see that um, that recently Gene Callahan, who's the author of one of the introductory uh, textbooks, what he what he has done is is challenge this idea of uh, methodological individualism and also implicitly subjectivism, but mostly individualism. So if you're interested in seeing actual people who are really hit deep in the Austrian tradition arguing these particular issues, you can go ahead and, and look at that discussion and it's hyperlinked on the lecture notes. But again, that's, that's optional. So as far as methodological subjectivism, what we mean here is simply that the, the standard sense is that we're, we're using the subjective theory of value, okay? And when I used to teach at Hillsdale, this was a very tricky issue, it was very controversial. Um, the, a, lot, a lot of the people there, because Hillsdale, of course, was a very traditional school, and there were a lot of people there that were uh, conservatives, and, and they were a little bit skeptical of this. They thought that this had something to do with, uh, you know, relativism in terms of ethics or morality. Or, you know, that we were denying that there was any such thing as objective truth if we walked around saying we were methodological subjectivists, that we were saying, you know, right and wrong is in the eye of the beholder. And, and that's not what this has to do with. What In economics, methodological subjectivism, all that really means is that we're trying to explain market prices. If, if someone says to me, you know, why is the price on a pack of cigarettes what it is, and how come the price of something else is what it is, something like uh, broccoli, you know, what, why is the price per pound of cigarettes higher than of uh, broccoli? You really can't get anywhere in that explanation unless you're allowed to talk about the fact that some people really like smoking cigarettes, right? That, that they subjectively value that experience and they're willing to pay for that. And for, for a lot of people, they're willing to pay a lot more for cigarettes than they are for broccoli. Okay, so that's that's really all this has to do with, okay, that you have to get inside the heads of the people in the marketplace in order to make sense of their behavior. So it's not that you're condoning their behavior. It's not that you're um, saying that all consumer preferences are equally um, useful or equally good from some sort of ethical viewpoint. Of course, that's not what we're saying. All we're saying is as economists, in order to explain these things, we have to take people's preferences as given. All right, and, it's just, and just acknowledge the fact that people have subjective preferences. Now, the real w way, the, the illustration of just the, the power of this insight, and to show you how if you didn't have this insight, you really couldn't even get off the ground in terms of, of value theory and, and talking about exchanges, is the idea that under subjective value theory, you understand when people make a voluntary exchange, each party walks away from the exchange better off than when he went into it. All right, because when you make a voluntary exchange, you at least have the anticipation that what you're giving up is less valuable than the thing you're receiving. But the other person thinks the same thing, it just in reverse. All right, and so that's really only possible if you have a subjective theory of value. Okay, because think of it this way, something that's, that's objective, something that's really intrinsic to the objects themselves, like, like mass or weight, you, you couldn't have that outcome. It can't be the case that two people walk up to each other, they swap items, and then they both walk away with the heavier item. That would be physically impossible, at least with the, the type of physics that, that we believe to be operating in everyday life. Okay, you can't, two people do an exchange can't both walk away with an object that's heavier than the object they walked in the exchange with. Okay, because again, weight or mass is an objective feature of items, of physical things in the real world, and it's uh, not in the eye of the beholder, at least, again, in standard classical physics. Let's not, let's not get into crazy stuff with, with Einstein or, or quantum theory here. Okay, so I think everyone gets that point. Whereas it does make perfect sense if, if uh, you know, Bill has a, a Milky Way and, and Sarah has a Snickers, and they each value the other thing more, and they exchange. In their mind, they can both be walking away with the better tasting candy bar. And why is that possible? Because um, 
somebody's opinion of the enjoyment they're going to get from a candy bar that's not sitting in the candy bar itself. That's not a physical property of the candy bar. Obviously, the physical attributes of the candy bar have something to do with it, right? That if you if somebody injects something disgusting into the candy bar and you go and take a bite, you might say, oh, this, this actually doesn't give me the satisfaction I was expecting. So obviously the real world matters. It's not just that everything is in your head, but the point is things in the real world, the way they impact e economic outcomes is because they work through subjective valuations, all right? That they, they move things around on people's value scales, which are themselves subjective. So that's what we mean about methodological subjectivism. And it's true, modern schools of thought, they do not, uh, m most schools of thought, like the, the neoclassical mainstream, they also have a subjective theory of, of value or price. And um, there are some that don't, but we're not going to get into that right now. But the standard mainstream economists, you know, somebody like Paul Krugman, for example, he would be a methodological subjectivist in the narrow sense of he believes in the subjective theory of, of value as far as price theory goes. But as, as we'll see, and, and you'll find this more in the reading, the Austrians really push it a lot more that in terms of, especially when it comes to the capital structure, you'll see the very categories that we're going to use are always ultimately going back to people's subjective understanding of the situation in the environment. All right. And so again, the Austrians, I think, really push through subjectivism a lot more completely than other economists, even those other economists might say, hey, we believe in the subjective theory of value too. All right. Another major tenant of the Austrian school and what distinguishes it from most of its rivals is the Austrian focus on what we can call the market process as opposed to equilibrium determination of, of wages and prices. All right, so the way the Austrians explain things and the way that they think about the economy is they want to say, yes, there is this, this hypothetical equilibrium end state, if you will, given all of the conditions of the economy, given consumer preferences and given uh, resource constraints and given uh, the firm structure and all these types of uh, bits of information or, or facts about the world and about the people who are in it. Given all that, yes, there is this sort of hypothetical end state equilibrium position that the market is tending towards. But the Austrians don't really spend a lot of their time just focusing on that final equilibrium state. Rather, what the Austrians spend a lot of their time discussing is the process by which the market moves toward that end state. And that's really where the entrepreneur comes in. It's the entrepreneur in the Austrian tradition who uh, can see what's called arbitrage opportunities. All right, So the entrepreneur is the one who sees that there's an unfulfilled consumer demand out there. The entrepreneur realizes, you know what, I can make a bunch of money, I can make a, a, a profit here if I bought resources at a certain price, combine them in certain ways, and then sold them for a higher price to this market that I anticipate is going to be there in the future waiting for me once I get this, this materials together. All right, And some of who just heard what I said wouldn't disagree with that. You know, One of them, uh, I, I saw one time... I forget who it was, but somebody was reviewing the work of Israel Kirzner. And Israel Kirzner, as you may know, is an Austrian economist who focuses a lot on entrepreneurship. I mean, that's one of the staples of what Kirzner's whole career has been based on, is just the discussion of entrepreneurship in the Misesian tradition. And, and one of these mainstream economists summarized Kirzner's whole career saying something like, Kirzner just formalized the obvious, okay, that... In other words, this person thought, yeah, sure, go ahead and, and, yeah, we have to give some story at the end of the day about how the market moves toward equilibrium, but, you know, you don't need to be writing whole books on that. That's just an afterthought. The real hard part of economics is you roll up your sleeves and you figure out how to compute all the uh, various equilibria conditions and various equilibria position, positions that the economy could be in, right? So that's what the mainstream economists focus on. If you go to a graduate level program, that's what you're going to find. That you're really you're not even going to think that you're learning economics. You're going to think you're learning a bunch of math because because you are. And the reason you have to learn so much math is that 
the way they've defined the enterprise of economics is you have to list a bunch of necessary and sufficient conditions you know what has to be true for us to be in equilibrium and they say okay the consumer has to be maximizing utility subject to his income and prices businesses have to be maximizing their profits and then typically they're going to assume those profits have to all be zero because if, if some were positive then people would rush into that industry and, and that wouldn't be equilibrium so businesses are maximizing their profits given their technology and the prices of resources and and uh, output goods and their maximization yields them zero profit so that has to all be true and uh, you know, supply has to equal demand in all the various markets and so forth so what they do is they set up this mathematical list of conditions that all would have to be true for there to be an equilibrium and then if they've made the correct assumptions on you know this is the way the utility function works and this is the type of technology we're gonna have and so forth if they make enough uh, mathematical assumptions about the forms of the things they're plugging into these equations they can guarantee the existence of an equilibrium okay so just the, the terminology I'm having to use here to explain to you what they do I'm trying to keep it in English but I can't because in order to precisely tell you what it is they do you can't help but get real mathematical because that's what they're doing so the, the, that's to sort of maybe shed light if you don't understand you know why is these mainstream guys publish articles that are just chock full of all these equations it's because that's the route that they decided to go down and they think that that's extremely rigorous and there's a certain appeal in that that if you have it in terms of equations and you go ahead and give a logical deduction and proof they can point to that and say you know this is airtight given our assumptions this is an airtight thing and that's true but the assumptions are very unrealistic and in particular is this point three here that we're talking about uh, stresses the the huge thing they leave out is how does the market get to the equilibrium position they just focus on that end state and they spend so much time cataloging the various types of equilibria and gee should the government adopt policies to nudge us towards this particular equilibrium versus this one over here and you know how do we rate the various equilibrium which one do we want society to be in and that's the kind of thing they talk about when they're overlooking the fact at least from the Austrian point of view, that without entrepreneurs, without understanding how it is the market gets there, the government actually, these policies would, could, could sabotage the, the equilibration process. All right, and then also the, the Austrian theory of the business cycle itself, it is very hard to tell that story in an equilibrium context. Okay, so that's one component of the Austrian story is during the, the boom phase, it's really not an equilibrium. I mean, it's true people are are doing the best they can, and they're and they're optimizing in a sense. But the Austrians are going to say that's an unsustainable framework. Okay, and so it's very difficult when a mainstream economist is trying to even just talk to an Austrian and understand, you know, what, what is your guy's theory of the business cycle? It's hard to even and tell them in their own language because again, they they very rarely even think about the possibility that the the economy isn't in equilibrium. But that's kind of a almost a necessary situation if you're talking about widespread errors in the midst of a of a boom. Okay, another crucial aspect of the Austrian school that we're going to need to really focus on for this particular class, and this is going to be the focus of what we do next week. Let me also say right now before I forget, I should have mentioned this up front people want to know do they need to do the reading well if you're if you're taking this class for credit I mean, we're sort of doing a two-tiered system here on the one hand I want to just give these introductory lectures so that if you're just auditing because you're pretty busy and you have the time to sit here and listen to my lectures but that's really all you can do I'm trying to give you enough so that these things are self-contained enough that you get something out of it and if you just watch these lectures for the nine weeks of the class that you would walk away with a pretty good understanding of the basics of Austrian theory. But for those of you who are really, you know, you really want to be experts on this after you walk out of this class, um, we're, t we're picking the readings for you. Okay, so for those of you who look at the reading, now, some of the readings later on, I'm not saying that those, you know, th those particular assignments, they might bounce around a little bit as we go through. But for example, the reading for next week, I mean, there, there are a lot of pages from the DeSoto book, but it, it's because... You know, I can't in these lectures go through and define every last term and things like that, which, whereas you need to know those concepts 
to call yourself an expert in Austrian business cycle theory. So that's why the reading load some weeks is going to be fairly heavy is because I know some of you really want this to be the, the class that, that, that tells you about Austrian theory and all its intricacies. And so that's why the, some of the readings are heavy. What I would do, my suggestion, if you are going to do the readings, is at least try to start them before the relevant Monday lecture. So at least, you know, try to go through it and look at the readings on capital theory before this coming Monday's lecture so that that way, um, you know, first of all, you're not hearing the stuff I'm going to tell you completely new, that you have some background to help you place the stuff in context. And also, it will allow for your questions to be a little bit more focused in the Q&A. That it'll be better if you started the DeSoto reading, for example, and got stuck. And then in the Monday Q&A session, you could ask me about that particular issue as opposed to, you know, you really don't know what to ask me on Monday because you just heard the lecture and then you go try to do the reading two days later and then, you know, and then you're stuck and hope and then you just have to send me an email. So, so that's the idea. I would recommend you at least try to do the readings first and then um, after my lecture, then you can go back and, and look at the parts where you had a little trouble. Okay, so the time structure of production what that means, is, this has to do with, with the capital structure. All right? And again, next week this will all make a lot more sense. But for our purposes right now, the idea is the Austrian school, when they think about capital, they don't just think of it in terms of some aggregate number. They don't think of it as a stock of stuff and say, well, gee, how much capital is there? And say, oh, we have 10% more capital this year than we did last year. And that's the way that mainstream economists typically think about it. All right, that if you've seen things like the solo growth model and the, uh, the derivatives of that, models that were inspired by that and in that tradition, they typically look at the capital stock as this num number that they call capital K. And the idea is that you know, if people, there's a certain amount of labor and that combines with the capital at the beginning of the period and it yields a certain amount of outcome. So as long as gross investment is bigger than the depreciation, the wearing away of the capital stock for that period, then K next period is bigger than K this period, and this, so that net investment is positive, and that means next period, the labor combines with the bigger capital stock, and you get more output. All right? So that's the way mainstream economists model growth, and they can show the trade-off between uh, consumption today and consumption down the road because they do allow for the fact that if you save more, the capital stock grows more quickly and then outputs higher the bigger k is other things equal okay so that's so that's the idea and the austrians in contrast they have what's called a time structure of production okay so um there the idea is it's not just that at any given period you can ask how much capital is there but on the contrary the capital it has its own little niche that it, it fits into the capital structure and the way the Austrians catalog it is that they, they, they look at it in terms of how far removed from consumption the particular capital good is okay and the Austrian and you'll see this in the reading more next week I don't want to dwell on too much right now but the idea is the consumer goods are called first order goods and then capital goods things that help you make consumer goods are called second order goods. But then you can have capital goods that help you make second order goods and those are called third order goods and so forth. All right, so the idea is you have this time structure of production and so an economy that's, that's normal, that's in its healthy configuration, the different components all interlock together and work together. Okay, and what needs to happen, I mean just think about something like when you go to the store to buy a, a television set that's on the shelf. You go to Best Buy and you want to go buy a plasma screen TV, okay? Then um, if you just think back of all the interlocking processes that had to come together just right in order for that consumer good to be sitting on the shelf, it's really mind-boggling when you think through all the things that had to come together just right. So it certainly would be an oversimplification to say, oh, well, where did that plasma screen TV come from? Well, this period, we, in the beginning of the period, we started out with this capital stock K, which we mixed with some labor, and then boom, out popped the plasma screen TV. That if that's the way you thought about things, you can see how maybe you would be missing some real important subtleties, and maybe you wouldn't really understand what happens during a boom-bust cycle if you just think of capital as this glob of stuff 
that you know you can just shoot out and 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 um, create various types of cons consumer goods just by taking this glob and molding it, which is kind of the way that the mainstream economist thinks about it. Okay, so that's really the issue is the mainstream economist can't really even think about the Austrian story or theory of the boom bust if they don't first understand Austrian capital theory. And that's really the great virtue of Roger Garrison's um, PowerPoint presentation is that you'll see the way to translate the Austrian theory of the boom bust cycle into fairly typical mainstream terminology and, and graphics. Okay, so that's really what, what Garrison has done there with that, that PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, unfortunately, my seventh slide here is having a, a difficult time loading up. Are, are you guys seeing a white screen as well? Let me... Let me try to back up here. Okay, there we go. Can everyone see the thinker? Okay, great. Yeah, it was just it was slow on loading there for some reason. Okay, so the last thing, and I, I need to, to hurry up here because we're I want to stop at the fifth the fifteen minute mark. The uh, w one major tenet of the Austrian school, and here I want to clarify, this is the Austrian school in the tradition of Ludwig von Mises, which Murray Rothbard then adopted as well. Okay, so here, what I'm going to say is, does not necessarily apply to every person who calls him or herself an Austrian today, although the, the first uh, four tenets that I mentioned, they probably would all agree with, whereas this one pertains mostly to the people who explicitly identify with the Misesian and, and Rothbardian tradition. But here, um, the idea is the Austrians, what, what really distinguishes them from mainstream economists is this issue of how do you go ahead and discover or construct economic theory, basic economic laws. How do you figure out what those things are? And the mainstream economists, to the extent that they even worry about that, because a lot of them think that, oh, that's philosophy, who cares? Just get out there and do your economics. Stop, stop worrying about how you do economics. Just go do it. Right, so that's what a lot of mainstream economists would say, whereas the ones who do want to give sort of a methodological uh, underpinning to what they're doing, they would agree with what Milton Friedman said in his essays on positivist e or positive economics. And, and what they would do normally say is a, the standard story you hear of, of what the scientific method is supposed to be. But they would say, yep, yeah, you as an economist, you go out and you come up with a theory to explain certain things in the market. And then you come up with testable implications of your theory, and then you go collect data, and you see how well did your theory predict. And yes, you have to make certain simplifying assumptions in order to make the theory tractable, but it's okay as long as your predictions are close enough, or at least as long as your theory with its simplifying assumptions gives better predictions than some more realistic theory that you know um, is more cumbersome or harder, harder to, to use, then it, it's perfectly fine. And, and that's, that's um, you know, the, the ultimate justification for using economic models that have admittedly false assumptions right at the get-go. That's what a mainstream economist would say if you pushed them and said, how can you possibly use this model to recommend government policies when you know these assumptions you have in the beginning are crazy? They would say if, if they you know, thought about that sort of objection, they would, the typical answer would be, hey, this is science. This is how science works. You know, the world is a very complex thing. In order to get off the ground, we have to make some simplifying assumptions. And so these are the things we're doing. And we think that our results are pretty good um, given the constraints we have. And if you want to go ahead and come up with a theory that's more realistic, you're free to do so. But unless you can give us better predictions, then, you know, stop thinking your theory is better than ours. Okay, so that, that's the idea. Whereas the Misesians and Rothbardians, in contrast, they think that, no, that's a complete misunderstanding of what we're doing in economics. That, that that might work for the natural sciences, but in economics, they're going to say, what what we do is we start from the premise or the axiom that humans act. And what we mean by action is purposive behavior, uh, intentional behavior. So that when you see 
human beings moving around. You see their bodies moving, you see them doing things, you see people's hands doing this, and you see physical objects moving from one person's pocket to another. The way as an economist that you want to say, oh, you know what that is? That's that's commerce. That's buying and selling. And those those things that are moving from people's pockets to the other people's pockets, I'm going to call that money. The idea is in order for you to even have that classification, for you to have that framework, those categories of analysis, it's not that you go out and discover those things. It's not that if you if you didn't know what money was that you could just go out and run a bunch of experiments and then realize, oh, there's this thing called money. I didn't realize, but now... Uh, because of all these experiments and observations, now I see that there's this thing called money, right? That, that Mises and Rothbard think that's fundamentally misunderstanding what it is we do in economics. That w the way we interpret the world is we come to it with this antecedent theory, all right? And so what they're saying is for true economic laws, the way you derive them is not through testing. It's not through experimental verification, and then you got to go ahead and tweak the parameters to get closer and closer to the observed experimental results. That's not what you do in economics. What you do in economics is you start from the premise that humans act, that we're going to say when I'm observing bodily movements, when I'm observing the atoms and so forth of people's bodies going through space, I'm not just going to say that, yep, that's the laws of physics. As an economist, I'm going to say some of that behavior, that matter in motion, I'm going to classify as action. I'm going to say that is the result of an, a goal-seeking, intentional, conscious being, right? That I can't see it. It's not that you can go see somebody's intentionality. It's just a way you have of explaining what your senses are observing. That you're going to say, I'm going to assume that, that the reason I'm observing these things is because there are people there who have subjective goals and they're using means to achieve ends. And once you go down that path, a lot of things follow from it. And that's what the Austrians think. So um, that's really, now the work of, of Hans Hoppe, I think in the modern, you know, since Mises and Rothbard, I think Hoppe is the one who's really fleshed this stuff out the most, if you're familiar with his, with his work. Okay, but again, let me just give you an example. Um, if you accept the premise that somebody has uh, subjective preferences, subjective goals that they're trying to achieve, then it sort of pops out of the fact that there's going to be trade-offs. That person's going to have costs, right? Because if there's scarcity and the person can't just achieve everything the person wants, well, then the person needs to subordinate some goals to others. Some things are more preferred than other things. And then when the person uses means to achieve one goal, necessarily that means there's some other goal that now can't be fulfilled. And so that's where costs come into play. That's where trade-offs come into play, right? So you see there, it's not that those are two, two separate things and that, okay, yeah, we think that people have intentional goals and we think there's scarcity. And then now let's, let's, we have this theory that maybe there's trade-offs or opportunity cost and let's go design an experiment to see, is there really opportunity cost? The idea is no, if you're thinking like that, you're getting things completely mixed up. That if you're going to go ahead and commit to saying, I think people out here, um, they have intentions and they're trying to achieve ends with their action. Once you go down that road, well, then they have to have opportunity costs as subjectively appraised in their own minds, right? So cost isn't an objective thing. Each person experiences or um, has to reckon with opportunity cost when he or she is acting, okay? You can't have action in the Misesian sense without having opportunity cost. Okay, let, now what I'm going to do is uh, comment on just the, the readings of the, the introductory material. So the readings that you had for week one that pertain to introductions to the Austrian school. So let me just go through these, and I'm going to speed up here because, again, for those of you who joined us late, what I'm going to do is, is do this formal lecture until 15 after. Then we'll stop and take a 15-minute break, and then I'll come back for an hour and a half of, of Q&A for those who want it. And, again, if you're done, if you've had enough after – I stop in a, in a few minutes from now, then you're free to go. You don't need to stick around for the Q&A. The Q&A is just for your benefit. It's, it's not that I'm going to you know, drop new bombshells that you need to hear or else you're going to fail the exam. All right, so uh, Rockwell's Why Austrian Economics Matters. Again, that's just a very nice, quick introduction for those of you who are new to this school. The one uh, sort of 
caveat I want to give you is Rockwell there, I believe that was a speech he was giving to the Heritage Foundation, all right? So he wanted to cover a bunch of points. He couldn't uh, give every little last caveat and so forth. So a few points, places in there, he'll come across and say things like, you know, the Austrian economist doesn't believe in, in, in rent control or something like that, you know, doesn't believe in government policies along these lines. And just make sure you understand, strictly speaking, Austrian economics per se does not make policy recommendations. Austrian economics is an objective science, and it's a, it's a way of understanding market outcomes. But strictly speaking, uh, you know, you, you, could, you could be an Austrian economist and say that you think the government ought to uh, impose price controls. Right? Let, let's just say you're a misanthrope and you hate people. And you really derive satisfaction from seeing, uh, you know, people go without bread and things like that. Well, then you consistently could be an Austrian economist. You could understand Austrian economics, and you could say, "I recommend that the government impose price controls because I like see, on, on bread because I like seeing people go hungry." Right. So there's no, there would be no contradiction there. You, you would be a jerk, but the idea is that wouldn't make you a bad economist if you understand the distinction I'm drawing there. So, um, and, and the reason we stress this is. There's a complaint that, oh, you Austrians, you're just ideological. You, you know, you're very anti-government, and so you just develop your economic theories to give you that conclusion. All right, and so yes, there in practice there's a big overlap, and it tends to be the case the people who nowadays are Austrian economists are also, you know, very small government people, and some are actual anarcho-capitalists, meaning they don't think the government should do anything at all. But the point is libertarian political theory is distinct from Austrian economics per se. All right, the, uh, as far as Taylor's introduction here, let me just say that I really think um, this is sort of a, an overlooked classic in the Austrian tradition, that if you want to just have a very slim volume that gives you um, an introduction to Austrian economics, this is really helpful. All right, now the problem is it's a little bit uh, dense, okay, that it's, he, he, Taylor does a great job of boiling down a lot of material into a surprising, surprisingly economic number of words, but because of that, the reading is a little bit tough for some people. So that's why if, if, if Taylor's just not clicking for you, then um, we also have included Gene Callahan's uh, book. So for all these things, you don't have to read these intros cover to cover. Okay, so let me be clear there. The All you need to read in order to get through this class is the stuff that we assign on the syllabus. I'm just saying if you want to learn more about the Austrian school, then these three things are really the place to start, in my opinion. Right? That if you really want the quick, you know, one sitting introduction, go ahead and read Rockwell's essay. If you want sort of lighter reading, but that but it's longer and more elaborated, that you know, really, really takes you through various topics, then go ahead and read Gene's book. And if you want something that's a less time commitment than Gene's book, but uh, might be a more formal writing and a little bit harder for some people to, to digest, then go ahead and read Taylor's book. Okay. The last thing here is uh, people have asked me what Gene's playing with there. I have no idea what that is. I think maybe he was trying to uh, model the human genome or something there, but I don't know what that thing is. Okay, now in the remaining eight minutes or so here, what I'm going to... Um, talk about here is that the we, we gave the Austrian introduction in the beginning and now I'm just going to quickly give you the 30,000 foot overview of the Austrian business cycle theories. Make sure you understand what it is we're going to talk about in this course. The okay, first thing I want to mention is interchangeable terminology. When we get hit deep into the readings, especially in the DeSoto book, it's going to there we might make some very fine distinctions. But for right now, unless I say otherwise, if I use phrases like the Mises Hayek trade cycle theory or the circulation credit theory or uh, the theory of the Austrian theory of the business cycle or the, the theory of the boom bust, you know, these things are basically all interchangeable. Okay, so you don't have to get hung up right now about, oh gee, what is there a difference between the trade cycle theory and the boom bust cycle theory? No, those are interchangeable at this stage of the course. All right, what, what else is, is an integral part of the Austrian theory of the business cycle? I like to just say, look, interest rates mean something. And what's funny is 
you know, you, you would think, how can that be controversial? Wouldn't every economist think that? But really, if you go and, and, and look at the talking heads on CNBC or even you read the op-eds in the Wall Street Journal from professional Ph.D. economists in Chicago and elsewhere, really, the, they had the, a vague sense that if the Fed engages in loose monetary policy, that it, it's not good for the economy, that it might give a false feeling of prosperity. But really, typically what, they, what the, the downside is going to be is they're going to say there's going to be price inflation down the road, right? That's typically where the, where the problem comes in as far as mainstream economists are concerned. So, yes, you do have a lot of people now thinking that Greenspan um, maybe held interest rates too low. And, and more and more economists are starting to say maybe that fueled the uh, housing bubble. But even there, they don't really have this idea that interest rates serve to coordinate things intertemporally. I think they're more what those mainstream economists have in mind is when the Fed lowers interest rates, it does that by throwing in a bunch of new money. And, oh, gee, that money hit the housing market, and that's what pushed up prices. And I think that's really the extent of most economists now, even those who blame Greenspan for the housing bubble. Right? So, again, you see just the, the crucial importance of Austrian capital theory. You can't even understand the Austrian view of what happens during a boom phase if you don't understand Austrian capital theory. Okay, another sort of ironic component of the Austrian approach to business cycles is this idea that the boom is bad and the bust, in a sense, is good. Now, when, when we say the, the boom is bad, what do we mean? Well, obviously, it's not that we're, we mean we like people to be unemployed, because during the boom period, unemployment drops. It, think, it seems like times are good. You know, uh, people have jobs, wages are rising, business profits are soaring, everyone seems optimistic. And so most economists want to say, how do we keep the boom going? That seems to be the focus of their uh, efforts, their policy recommendations. Whereas the Austrians say, no, during the boom, mistakes are being made. Entrepreneurs are systematically misallocating resources. And so... Um, that's the sense in which the boom is bad. You're making the economy, the longer the boom progresses, the more and more unsustainable the configuration of the economy becomes. And it's going to make it that much harder when the crash comes. The longer you pump up the bubble, the longer you, you build up the boom, the bigger the fall is going to be. And again, right now, we can just you know, I can just use those, those uh, phrases to talk about it, but as we later in the course get into Austrian capital theory, you'll really see much better and concretely how that works. And what does it mean to say the economy becomes unsustainable? You know, it'll make much more sense to you the further we get into this class. Now, having said all that, what does it mean when the Austrians, in a sense, say that the bust is good? Well, again, it's not that we like unemployment. It's not that we're uh, sadists and we like seeing people suffer. That's not it at all. What we're saying, though, is the bust period is when finally – the people in the economy have recognized that, that they were making tragic systematic mistakes during the boom. All right? So for an analogy, if you got a bunch of people on an ocean liner that's heading for an iceberg, and everyone's playing music and they're eating the, the hors d'oeuvres and everyone's dancing and it's great. And we're like, oh, this is great. You know, we're, we're so wealthy and it's, I'm glad we took this cruise on this nice ocean liner and life is good. There's a set, and, and then, you, you know, some, some kid is looking out and he sees the iceberg in the distance. Now, there's a sense in which you could say, no, 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 don't tell everyone. You'll just spoil the party. Just keep that to yourself because we want to keep these good times rolling. Look at how much fun everybody is having, and we don't want to spoil their fun. It would really bum everybody out if you told them we were heading for an iceberg. You know, so don't be a jerk. Don't be a party pooper. Right? So you, you can understand a certain logic in that, but on the other hand, no, that's crazy. You see the ship is heading for an iceberg. You need to go tell the captain immediately, and he needs to tell... All the you know the people who make decisions that affect the ship that they need to change what they're doing immediately. That the quicker the captain finds out the, that the ship's going towards the iceberg, the the less damage there's going to be. And, and maybe if he gets the, the message in time, it won't be a big deal. It'll just be you know people will be nervous. Uh, maybe you know the um, the ship will move sharply and people might lose their balance, but not a big deal. Or you see, of course, the later the captain gets that message. Maybe it's too late and they're going to smash into the iceberg, okay? But you get the analogy. So it's the same thing here, that what happens during the bust phase 
is businesses realize they have been making mistakes. And so they stop what they're doing, they lay people off, and they reconfigure, and they reevaluate what do we want to do going forward in light of all these mistakes we've been making for the last few years. So the earlier we end the boom and nip it in the bud, the better from the Austrian point of view, because all you're doing is digging a deeper and deeper hole the more you prolong the boom period. And that's exactly why, just to, to make it relevant for you today, the things that, that Bernanke is doing, holding interest rates down so low, that's, that's not good. Right, it, that's the equivalent. That's the analog of the little boy seeing that they're heading toward the iceberg, and someone telling him, "No, no, no, let's keep that to yourself. We don't want to spoil everyone's good time." You know, they're already depressed because you know we almost hit the iceberg two uh, two days ago on this voyage, and you're just going to really depress everyone even more if now you say there's another iceberg coming. Right, so it's the same sort of thing here that people think, "Oh man, that, that housing bust was bad." So we can't deal with another strong recession. We, let, let's get some easy tonic from the Fed and have super low interest rates. And the idea is no, Bernanke's not doing anybody any favors. He is just making it that much worse when we finally face the reckoning. Okay, uh, I'm just going to go a few more minutes here. Um, and then we'll stop for the, the break period. I just want to give you some comments as you're going ahead and, and reading through uh, the, the material. And really, I don't have too much to say. Um, again, Taylor, it, it provides a good introduction. Let me just skip ahead. The one thing I want to say about Gene's book, so his, his, biz, his uh, chapter on times are hard, which is his, his chapter on the business cycle theory, he makes an analogy there with people driving a bus across a desert. So, you know... We went. Gene and I went back and forth. I was one of the reviewers for the, for this book. You know, when he was writing it, the manuscript, and I, I wasn't sure that analogy has never quite clicked with me personally. All right, so I'm not not knocking the book. I still think it's a great book. Someone asks me, "What's the one book you recommend to learn Austrian economics?" I give him Gene's book. All right, so I love Gene's book. I'm just saying this particular analogy that he uses. I think it's not the best one, just because. Um, People get hung up on the analogy, and they'll, and they'll say, you know, well, gee, what's what's the air conditioning? What what is that? You know, and, and what's the the amount of gas that the bus has? What's it? And it's, I mean, I'll go through and, and tell you what the what the analog is and what what Gene has in mind. But I'm just saying, for some reason, this particular analogy didn't uh, ring as true to me as Mises' analogy of the master builder who's building a house and he doesn't realize how many bricks he has. Okay, so there, Mises' analogy is. Imagine a guy's building a house and he has the blueprints he's drawn up and suppose he thinks he has 10% more bricks to work with than he really does. So he's given orders to all the people to start laying the foundation, to start putting bricks on the, on the you know, first floor and so forth. And if it turns out that he, his blueprint calls for using more bricks than he actually has on hand, well, he's got a problem. He can't possibly finish that house according to the blueprints. It's an unsustainable design, if you want to think of it like that. And the idea is the sooner he realizes the true brick count, the better off he is. The earlier he can catch his mistake and then revamp the blueprints in light of the reality and maybe salvage the house. Whereas if he finds out, you know, if someone comes up to him and says, guess what, we just ran out of bricks and his blueprint still called for you know 10% more than he had, had already been using, well then he's really in trouble at that point. He's going to have to scramble just to get the roof on the house to make sure rain doesn't get in. But the house is going to look crazy. Whereas if he learns early on what the true brick count is, maybe he can redesign the blueprints and have a much more modest house that still looks normal when you drive past it. Like you wouldn't realize that, whoa, some, some idiot designed that house. Okay, that's the idea. So again, if, if Gene's analogy doesn't ring true for you, don't get all hung up on it. it. Just It's just an analogy. If it doesn't work, some people love it. I've seen reviews of Gene's book and they say, you know, I never understood Austrian business cycle theory until I read Gene's chapter. So, you know, if it works for you, good. But if it doesn't, don't get hung up on, on the analogy. Okay. Um, the last thing here is the infamous rap video. Um, a few people, believe it or not, haven't seen this yet. So if you just go to YouTube, it's uh, Fear the Boom Bust. Or if you just typed in... Hayek Kane's rap video, it's it's going to be the top hit. It's not like there's eight different Hayek Kane's rap videos and you're not going to be sure which one we're talking about. Um, again, if you haven't seen it, go ahead. It, it's pretty amusing. 
Um, and it's really great for something like what we're doing now, for, for understanding Austrian business cycle theory. It's a, it's a very pleasant introduction. One of the objectives of this class, or one of the ways you'll know that you're getting through this, is by the end of this course, you ought to understand everything in that video. Because it's, it's surprisingly accurate. It's surprisingly um, good about particular attention to, to subtleties, right? It's not just that, oh, yeah, he gets the big picture. No, it's really good. And what's really nice is I assumed when I first saw it that Russ Roberts, who was the economist that was sort of behind this, I figured that he wrote all the dialogue and that the guy who made the video, the artist, just was some creative person that, that it got outsourced to. And actually, no, this John Popola guy, he, he knows his stuff. He reads Austrian economics. And on the lecture notes for this, I've, I've linked to, the, to his talk at the recent Austrian Scholars Conference. And you can go ahead if you're interested and go ahead and look at that. It's a, it's a pretty interesting talk about the history of this particular video. And also, I think uh, I linked to an interview he gave with Jeff Tucker. Okay, um, so at this point, that ends the formal lecture.